Well, when we started out, we had children, or groups of five children working with one teacher. Due to financial reasons, we've sort of grown and grown, and now we have two teachers working with 15 children. But also what's important is that we only have one form entry, which means one class per year group. So our school is no more than about 100 children, and everybody knows each other. All the teachers know all the children on a first name basis, and there's a community. And what this achieves is a personalization, a, a way of bonding between the teachers and the students that we think actually goes back to the roots of Islam. So those of you who know how the scholars used to treat their students, they would see them as part of their family. Imam Ghazali's famous letter to his student, he said, my dear beloved son, and he addressed him in that manner. And this is what we're trying to recreate through human scale education in our school. The daily halakha is another characteristic of the Islamic Jihad Foundation. And this is a really core part of what the school's about. And this is a focal part of our day, where the children and the teachers actually sit in a circle, which is a traditional method of passing Islam to anybody and any circle of learners. They sit down on the floor, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and it's a type of bonding, understanding, spiritual um, reality of we are humbling ourselves in front of Allah. And this is where the core Islamic values are passed. And it's not through this, um, you listen and I speak. It's actually a shared thing. The children and the pupils, um, sorry, the teachers actually um, are involved in a communication about Islam and they import it into one another. Just the halakha makes me think about how we as a community are actually making Islam available to non-Muslims because there's a lot of non-Muslim educators who we come into contact with on a daily basis. And when we tell them about halakha, we tell them about the development of the children orally, they are wowed by this. And they come and see our children, and Ofsted, for example, have commented that our children are confident and able to express themselves and to think things through. And they said, this is down to your halakha. And this is really important because one thing I want to share with you is our school is not just about the Muslim community. A number of our children, they have non-Muslim grandparents. And our non-Muslim grandparents, and I would like to say a very special thank you to one particular family who have supported us right from the beginning, which is the Hamilton family. So we're talking about um, Veronica Hamilton, who is an auntie yes, to us. Yes, she is. And when we need her, she'll come in and clean up. Yeah. Because that's the best she can do. And it's, we're it's her about, school. It's, it's her school as well. Her, her son, David yeah. Hamilton, who's not Muslim. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, may Allah guide him and may Allah cure yeah. his eyesight because he has eyesight issues. He will come in and help. And her husband, uncle, I can't remember his yeah. name, will transport furniture for us. And I would like to say a special circle of prayer, a special thank you, and may Allah want to guide and reward these people, because without them, and these are non-Muslims, our school would not be here today. Amen, amen. So inshallah, the halakha is something that we're seeking to take out to non-Muslim schools, and we're in discussion with various people about that at the moment. I think it's also a great strength of Islam Shiksiya, that the halakha is at the root of what we do, it's very important. Thematic curriculum. So basically, what we decided in the school, we've actually sat and thought about, we want to marry the, the, the um, Islam and the national curriculum, QCA themes, schemes of work, you know, as teachers will talk about. Um, but we want our children to have something more, and we've actually constructed a thematic nature to our curriculum, which actually broadens the children's education. So for example, um, if they're talking about journeys, we then start talking about journeys in, um, for example, science, so we talk about speed, motion, you know, we might then add in something about the journey of the soul in the halakha, from the time that we give, you know, allegiance to the oneness and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, the, to, to uh, how we will come to the dunya and then pass to the akhirah. So, the, you can see the breadth of the curriculum is really wide. So the thematic curriculum is actually a benefit to the student and it broadens their horizons and their thinking beyond the premises of the classroom and the school. What our children don't think is that, oh, we're doing science now. And what does that have to do with history? No, when they're having a lesson, they're seeing the links between science and history. They're seeing the links between Islam and everything. Even mathematics, we've had teachers integrate Islam with mathematics in spectacular ways. And that, we hope, what our children do tell us, means that they love to learn, inshallah. 
bilingualism, we call it, we've seen there, bilingualism and Quranic Arabic. Um, and the last few years we've been running um, our early years with a bilingualism focus, whereby there's two teachers in the classroom, one that speaks Arabic and one that speaks English. Now this is a real brilliant atmosphere to inculcate a love of the Arabic language, but really as well embed that in them so that when they move throughout the school, Arabic is a focal part of their learning and they understand the importance of learning Arabic because that would help them to really find the Quran slightly more easy to address and not to have to rely on you know, translations and, and at the mercy of the translator. Yes, our aim is that the children as they grow, when they leave the school, they progress with their Arabic and that when they're adults, they can open the Quran and understand it, not take your fatwa, you know, but understand it because they, without that, we as an Ummah, we, you know, we miss so much. And for them, the Quran, our beating heart, is a theme that runs throughout the school year. But mashallah, they've done some spe special work on it in the weeks around this presentation. I just want to also add that the level of Arabic in our school teacher, Nadi is not here today, but may Allah reward her and Amen. teacher Swad and Sheikh Adil and all the other Arabic teachers who've come in, because without their hard work, our children not, not, would not achieve what they achieve. And we've had 11 year olds, 12 year olds, and 13 year olds who've left our school and have achieved Arabic GCSE grade A star, and we're talking about non-Arabs here, inshallah. So we've got about 10, 15 children who start GCSE Arabic four or five years early and, and achieved grades from A star. Some got B's and C's, but mashallah, it's, it's an amazing achievement for them. Islamic teacher education. Um, alhamdulillah, something that you, we have to understand, we're building the students, then we need to also provide something for the, for the teachers. Um, and this is where we've actually put our heads together and thought, right, we need to provide some sort of a course for our staff and other Islamic um, schools. Um, this is whereby we actually um, Islamicize the teacher's practice. You know, you might come with a PGC or GTP or what have you, and then we really think and thrash out Islamic concepts of education and learning. Okay, you may not know that in Islam there's three words for education. Three, not one. There's tarbiya, there's ta'lim, there's ta'dim. Each of these words, you could write a PhD thesis on and more. And yet our teachers in our schools, we don't even maybe know a basic definition for these words. So for us, we spend a lot of time trying to research this, trying to find out more about it. And inshallah, we're trying to then share that, not only with our teachers in our school, but with teachers around the, you know, around the local areas who also attend our courses. Learning for the sake of and a love for learning. I think what we want our children to do when they leave our school is always want to seek knowledge. Um, and, you know, be readers, people who want to, you know, find out about, about the things that are happening around them um, and always want to, subhanAllah, read about Islam and, and understand that this, they, they, they want to move forward and input back into the society um, and, and be people who are doers because this is what Muslims are. Okay, the last one. Sorry, we've been boring you a little bit with educational business, but assessment for the learner. Okay, most of you will know, if you have children or grandchildren, how hard it is for your children at the age of a couple of years back, seven, and now 11, when they have to sit these sats, but they're tested at such a young and early age, and it seems like such a pointless exercise, even to the parents. At our school, we don't believe in doing that. We believe that assessment should be for the learner. That if you're doing a test or you're trying to work out how much a child knows, what's the purpose of that? Is that to say, so-and-so is better than so-and-so, or this school is better than this school? No, it should be just for learning purposes. And that's what we do. So we've developed a profiling scheme without grades, and we've worked really hard. This is, a lot of work goes into this. Sounds simple, but a lot of work goes into monitoring the children's progress without using testing, which is the easy means. So this is part of what we understand Islam, because in Islam, tarbiyah is not about hitting children against each other. Tarbiyah is about developing them holistically, their goal for this, is Shaksi Islamia. And that's why we call our school Islamic Shaksiya Foundation. Because our goal is to develop the personality of each and every child. Not to be the same. To be themselves, to be different, but to be strong Muslims, inshallah leaders for the future. And that I think is where we leave off. And hopefully you'll see our children in action. So can we have the children from year six in the London branch, if they're ready, to come onto the stage.
computers, satellites, radar and other equipment. <coughs> One of the most beautiful definitions of the Noble Quran is contained in the following saying of the Prophet وسلم, in which he said about the Quran. In it is an information about what was before you and an information about what will come after as well as solutions pertaining to the matters between you. It is a clear speech, not a jest. Whoever abandons the Quran out of arrogance, Allah will shatter him. And whoever seeks guidance in something else, Allah will leave him strain. The Quran is Allah's firm rope. It is a wise reminder and the right way. Neither passion can divert it, nor can tongues change it. The knowledgeable cannot satisfy the appetite for it, and neither can be spent out through continuous repetition. There is no end to its splendidness. Even the jinns, when they heard the Quran, could not resist without saying, Where you have heard a wonderful recitation, this Quran, which guides to the straight path. Who speaks according to the Quran speaks the truth. Who works by it will be awarded. Who, judge, who judges according to it, he is just, and who invites to it, he is guided to the straight path. During Quran week, we made up a nasheed called the Book of Light. Listen carefully and do join in when you can. <laughs> 